the integumentary system, also known as our skin. There are these four parts that we're going to go through, our four sections. The first section will be the functions of the skin and the outermost layer known as the epidermis. The integumentary system is known as our cutaneous membrane. It has two main layers, the epidermis, which is the outermost layer, and the dermis. You can see that here in this cross-section view. So this would be the epidermis. This is the outermost layer. It's gonna be made of epithelial tissue. And then we have our dermis, which is deeper. It's made of connective tissue. It's our stronger layer. It's actually what leather is made of. So that tells you how strong that is because it's all connective tissue, dense, irregular connective tissue specifically. And then we have the deeper hypodermis. It's one layer, but it's just made of fat, which is our loose adipose connective tissue. So we can see in this image here, the outer layer that's the epidermis, the main layer that is the dermis, and then the fat below. These are some of the functions of skin. So it protects us from abrasion. It actually protects us from dehydration in that it's helping to hold some of our water in, essentially, um, protects us from UV light and provides a big, big part of our immunity and preventing antigens from getting in our body. It plays a big role in our temperature regulation, whether we're trying to get, give off heat or prevent loss. We have nerve endings within our skin, so it's involved in sensation. Excretion, like our oil glands or our sweat glands. We talked about different types of glands in the last chapter, as well as helping to form vitamin D. The UV light that comes in our body that we actually try to protect ourselves from, you can see on the far left, we actually use that UV light to activate the formation of vitamin D. So the functions of the epidermis are as follows. The epidermis is gonna be stratified squamous epithelial tissue. We're gonna to need to know these five specific layers of the epidermis, but it's multi-layered. It's gonna obviously be flexible. It's on the surface of our skin. It's helping us prevent fluid loss, protects us from UV radiation. So these are all the things that our epidermis does. So for vitamin D formation, it begins with the sun. We have the rays of our sun shining down onto the surface of our skin, which is our epidermis. Our epidermis at the base of that has cells known as melanocytes. They are found within a layer, the bottom layer, remember there's five layers of the epidermis, known as the stratum basal. The UV light triggers the conversion of vitamin D3, cholecalciferol, that the liver and kidney will convert into to calcitriol. Calcitriol will help to increase the calcium absorption from the gut. So if you don't have enough UV light and therefore formation of vitamin D, you're going to not absorb as much calcium. Even if you're eating or consuming a lot of calcium, you won't absorb it unless you have sufficient amounts of these, which is why most of the milk is fortified with vitamin D. In the epidermis, the majority of the skin cells are known as keratinocytes. So obviously the epidermis is made of stratified squamous epithelial tissue. But the individual cells are known as keratinocytes because they make what's known as keratin. Keratin is really what we're talking about when we say it prevents dehydration. So it prevents our skin from drying out. I like to think of it as like our Gore-Tex layer or a waterproofing layer, and we'll get to which layer that is in a moment. The other cells in the epidermis are pigment-producing cells called melanocytes. Everybody has the same number of melanocytes, no matter what your skin color is. The differences in skin color is about how active your melanocytes are. So you can have inherently a high producing melanocyte activity so that you will have dark skin. If you have light skin, your melanocytes are not producing as much melanin, but if a light skin 
person is exposed to a lot of light or UV light, the melanocytes can change and increase their activity to try to darken the skin some for as a mechanism of protection. So everybody has the same number of melanocytes. The differences are more in the activity of those melanocytes. So what do they do? It produces the pigment known as melanin, and that's protecting our skin from UV damage. The ultraviolet radiation can cause breakdown of collagen as well as DNA mutations and be a source of cancer. And so melanocytes produce melanin to try to protect us from some of this UV damage. The epidermis itself is made of these five layers. They are listed from the outermost layer, which is the stratum corneum, and a little bit deeper is gonna be stratum lucidum, and then even deeper, halfway through, we can see it as the dark, almost black line, that's known as stratum granulosum. Then we have stratum spinosum right under that dark line. And then the very bottom in the picture on the right, we can see it's stratum basal. It's right above the light pink. So it's the bottom most of the dark pink. In the image on the right, the light pink is actually our dermis. So that's a different layer. So we're talking about stratum basal, stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, stratum lucidum, and stratum corneum. They are all part of the epidermis. So we can see on the right, the dermis itself is this larger layer that's the majority, and it's actually a majority of our skin, it's our known as our true skin. The epidermis is just this outermost layer. So the stratum basal, also known as stratum germinativum, is the bottommost layer of the epidermis. It's our healthiest layer because all the blood vessels are in the dermis. Remember, epithelial tissue is avascular. It doesn't have any blood vessels. So the ones that are closest to the blood vessels are the healthiest ones. So the cells in the stratum basal are a little more plump and they're actually a little more cuboidal shaped, even though the whole layer of the epidermis is known as stratified squamous epithelial tissue. In this bottom layer, the stratum germinativum, we can also find our melanocytes are found there, as well as some of our nerve cells at the ending, known as Merkel cells, for our light touch. Stratum spinosum is where we are actually making keratin. So this second layer from the bottom coming is going to start making keratin. And in here, we also can have some specialized cells that's part of our immune system in case we get a cut and some antigens come in. It's a way for our body to be alerted if anything's entering our body. Stratum granulosum is the dark black stripe layer. This is where the cells start to die. It's so far away from blood vessels that the cells no longer are healthy anymore and they start to die and they flatten out. This is where the keratin forms a nice seal across our epidermis that actually prevents water loss. So it's almost like a nice little layer of saran wrap on our body because it's helping to keep the moisture in. The stratum lucidum, which is just above it, is negligible in most parts of our body, but it is significantly thick in areas like the palms of our hand or the soles of our feet or areas where we have calluses developed. So it's in thick skin. The outermost layer is known as stratum corneum. So it is the outermost surface. It's what's touching everything. It, the fact that it's dead, a bunch of dead cells piled on is really wonderful for our immune system because if someone were to sneeze directly on you, those are dead cells. It cannot infect you that way. And so they flake off, they remove any antigens that are on your surface. It helps to resist abrasion. So it's involved in a lot of our protection. For our First part, you should be comfortable with the components and location of the cutaneous membrane. That would be the epidermis and the dermis. You should know the functions of the skin, the role of vitamin D, and the features and functions of the epidermis, as well as the function of melanocytes, 
and then the layers of the epidermis. You should know all five layers. You should know something about each layer. You should know where keratin's made. You should know what the layer where we become waterproof. You should know the layer that gets thicker with um, calluses or abrasion. You should know the outermost layer that's flaky. So you should know something about each of the layers and definitely be able to name them from an image. For the dermis, we have two layers within the dermis. So it's right under the epidermis. The dermis has a layer known as the papillary layer. It goes up and down, up and down, and it interlocks with the epidermis like jigsaw puzzle pieces. So it helps actually hold the epidermis onto our skin. That's known as our papillary layer. And in fact, the arrangements of our papillary layer at the ends of our fingers and toes form our fingerprint ridges. We also have another cell known as Merkel cells that are located here in the papillary layer for fine touch as well. The reticular layer is really our layer that we have that really strong, dense, irregular connective tissue. So the dermis is this portion. So this is a more zoomed out view of skin. We can see the epidermis up above, and then we can see all of this dense, irregular tissue contained within this circle here of the dermis itself. The layers of the dermis, again, papillary layer and the reticular layer. This is the sensory receptors that are found within our skin as a whole, but more particularly in the dermis, are thermal receptors. We have hot and cold. We have free nerve endings. They're coming up close to the epidermis. So the lighter, more fine touch is gonna to be located higher up, closer either part of the epidermis or at the in the papillary layer of the dermis. The deeper ones that we can see, finny pustles and the Pacinian ones, those ones are deeper into our skin. And we'll talk about all of these in a little more detail when we get to sensations later in a different chapter. But you should know the basic elements that Meissner's and Merkel are more fine touch. They're gonna to be higher up either in the bottom of the epidermis or top of the dermis. And then we have Pacinian and Raffinis, which are going to be deeper. We can see those more clearly in this image. The subcutaneous layer, that means below the dermis, is known as the hypodermis, and it's really just fat. So what do we know about the dermis? You should know the two layers, papillary layer and the reticular layer. You should know that the reticular layer is made of dense, irregular connective tissue. You should know the papillary layer is bumpy and it forms our fingerprint ridges and it's bumpy in that it interlocks with the epidermis. You should know about the different sensory receptors that are part of our skin. Accessory structures. Well, these are other parts that are still part of our skin, like hair, sweat glands, and fingernails. And although we've talked about these before as being part of epithelial tissue, in order for them to stay anchored in our body, they're actually found in the dermis, but they're made of epithelial tissue. Hair, the structures within hair, we can see is has these erector pili muscles. The erector pili muscles is what actually causes our hair, which normally falls at a slight angle, will cause it to come more straight up, more perpendicular to the, our skin. So it's used when we're cold, like making goosebumps. It actually creates loft to try to trap body heat. Or in a case, say, if you see an angry dog growling, it's meant for aggression to make the dog, in this case, look bigger. So it's used, it's involuntary, so it's used in aggression or when you're cold. Sebaceous glands, we can see them along the hair follicle, and you can see they've got white cells within them because fat is shown up white on these histology slides, and it is released with the hair. Not only does it help control bacteria, it produces sebum or oil, which helps make our hair and our surface of our skin more healthy, but they're always associated with a hair follicle. So we can see the follicle, although it's made of epithelial tissue, extends down into the dermis. Hair color, 
also has melanocytes. So melanocytes, remember, make melanin, which is the pigment. You go from either blondes, which have very little pigment, to people with really, really dark hair, which has a lot more pigment. Erector pili muscles, as we've mentioned, are attached to a hair follicle, and they can make your hair go from its normal laying along your skin to being more upright. Sebaceous glands are going to then be associated with the pores where the hair comes out to release oil. Fingernails, we have the body. That's the main fingernail that you can see. The nail bed is just below it, so it's part of stratum basal. The matrix is way back where it's forming the nail. It's past where the cuticle is. The nail fold is actually overlapping the nail root. Epichondrium is actually what our cuticle is. That's the nail fold itself. It's not making any nails. It's just helping. It's this extra layer to protect bacteria from getting up and under our nails. And the lunula is the most visible at the base of our nail. It's that white portion that is the sort of half moon. We can see in this picture where we can see the nail bed in NB. We can see the M is identified as the matrix. And F is the nail fold. And the EP is epichondrium. That's the cuticle. Another diagram here that might be a little bit easier to see. The glands in the skin, again, we talked about these previously. There are sebaceous glands. It produces in the holocrine method and that the whole cell ruptures, allowing oil to go out the hair follicle. There is the sudoriferous eccrine, or also known as marocrine. That's our watery sweat. So it's like beads of sweat on our forehead. Then there's the sudoriferous apocrine. That is also sweat, but it has more chunks of protein in how it's produced. And so those are clustered in areas near the genitals as well as in your armpits or axillary region. Here is the same slide again that we talked about earlier with regard to the three modes of secretion for the three types of glands. So marocrine in blue, watery sweat coming out, apocrine in red where it takes some cell chunks with it so it has more protein components sebaceous in yellow the whole cell ruptures in order for the oil to be released we can see here in blue are our sudoriferous marocrine or eccrine glands we can see in yellow these are going to be our sebaceous glands along the hair follicle but i don't have a picture here of the apocrines other integumentary glands are mammary glands. They're going to be found in breast tissue, and they will produce milk. And there's also seruminous glands. They actually make our earwax along our ear canal. So you should know the types of accessory structures, our hair, our glands, our fingernails. You should know the parts of hair. You should know the parts of our fingernails. And you should know the three types of glands the method of each mode of secretion, where they're located and what they secrete. And finally, how do we handle skin repair if it's damaged like a cut or burns? So skin repair has these three main steps. Inflammation in response to the damage in that it mobilizes our immune system to the area. Let's fight if there's any bacteria that entered this cut Inflammation helps to deliver all of our good immune system cells to the site of damage so they can actually help and start the healing process. Actually, also when skin is damaged, blood coming out is helping to clean the wound. Obviously, we don't want a lot of blood coming out, but the initial blood coming out of a cut helps to actually send away any potential antigens that may have entered our skin when, say, some, you got poked by a needle or something. So you start with inflammation, which mobilizes our own immune system or little fighters, as well as repair mechanisms to the site of damage. Then we have tissue formation. Here we have fibroblasts making new fibers, trying to reconnect, make more collagen, make more elastin, and slowly we can see a 
scab regressing as we are healing it from the deep layer to the more superficial. And finally, tissue remodeling. Even after the scab is long gone, there's going to be some remodeling or changes within the skin to solidify it and make it a lot stronger. So step one of this inflammation, inflammation as this vascular phase, that's the letting of the blood out and then immediately clotting. So now we're creating this clot and sealing it up after we've kind of let it flow for a little bit. Then our cells show up, our inflammation, we've delivered more cells to the site so we can fight off any bacteria that entered. The inflammatory response we can see listed here. Number two, we're going to repair different parts of the skin. So we have re-epitheliation, that means repairing the epidermis up top with our keratinocytes. We also have granulation, that means we're making more fibroblasts, more collagen by our fibroblasts in the dermis. And finally, our remodeling. We have our collagen type one and type three that starts to remodel in there. It's important for the strength of the repair and we, it actually plays a role in scar formation and ultimately during this time, the skin. In the early phases of this, this the clot has disintegrated, but the remodeling continues well after the clot has gone. In burns, it's classified in two ways, how deep the burn goes and how much of our surface is affected. So a first degree burn is going to be only the epidermis. Second degree burn is going to be a little bit of the dermis gone down. And so you can identify a second degree because it just has blisters. So blisters are now separating our epidermis from our dermis. Fluid has entered there. So we know we've done enough damage. It's penetrated the dermis or epidermis and it's just started into the dermis. Third degree burns is now we're all the way through the dermis. In fact, third degree burns do not feel any pain. Well, you don't feel pain in the burn part because you've burned off the nerve endings. Now the edge or the perimeter of the third degree burn, it will hurt a lot because you have exposed nerve endings. But the actual part that is a third degree burn, you won't feel it because the nerve endings have been obliterated. Fourth degree burns are so severe that it's actually gone into the muscle and bone. Now the coverage, it's known as the rule of nines. And so I want you to look here and see that 9% is the head, 9% is an arm, um, 9% is your other arm. We have 18%, which is basically two arms, is say the front of your torso. 18% um, is the back of your torso. We have a whole leg is 18%, and so we have one for each leg, and then that all those should add up to 99, and then you have 1% that makes up the head. So this is another image that shows you this, but if you imagine, say, one leg is 18%, it really is the skin exposure of two arms. So an arm is 9%. So it kind of gives you a sense of estimate. So a person, when they get burned, may not be burned in quite an organized fashion, but it gives you a good way, relatively speaking, to estimate the burn surface that a person has suffered, because this plays a big role in the IVs and rehydration process that a patient must get, depending on the surface exposure gone. Here is the depth of burns. So this would be the degree, whether we have a first degree, second degree, or third degree. So you should know the three main steps of the injury repair process and what's going on at each step. What's going on with inflammation and tissue repair? The effects of burns, not only the types of burns in terms of first degree, second degree, and third degree, but you should also be able to estimate the surface area that a person has burned. If I were to describe to you, somebody has a leg and an arm burnt, what would be the percent of their body that's burnt? So you should be able to utilize the rule of nines to estimate how much surface has been burnt on a, on a patient.